have the right side page, which is the you know Cornell formal more notes there, and the left side page um, where it's the student processing side. Um, this is called in the education world an interactive notebook. So just in case you want that terminology, if you're searching for something, the rest of the world doesn't call it cat notes. So I want to make sure that you know um, what to look for. So again, we want to focus on this because. Instead of having students copy information only, we want to have them master it, and that's where our left side page is going to um, allow us to have a little bit more room um, for that kind of stuff. Uh, so Ricky later is going to talk about the questions column, how to formulate those and that sort of thing, and the summary section. Um, that's the feedback we got from last year was that people weren't sure about those areas. So we're going to get to that. Um, but first, I want to just kind of talk a little bit about the left side page, hopefully give you a little bit of inspiration um, to mix things up. We don't want our students always coming in knowing exactly what we're going to do every day. Um, we all get stuck in the rut of kind of a similar thing with our notes. Um, so I went out and I looked for some things to try to get inspired, and I wanted to share them with you. First of all, give me a second here, about Pinterest. Who knows what Pinterest is? He has a 20 year old in house. I do so okay, I was going to say, it's only women that right. just raise their hands. It's an amazing site. Most people use it for like crafting home decor purposes. However, there is a ton of education stuff out there. You do not have to sign up for an account to use it. So if you're like, oh, I don't want anyone to know I have an interest account, you know, that you don't have to. You can look on it, you just can't save stuff. So you can absolutely get on there and look. Um, I searched for interactive notebook and found something for every single subject just by searching that. I did not even search for a particular topic or a particular subject. So obviously you can go on there and search more in depth for your particular subject and you're going to find a lot of stuff. So I encourage you to use that because um, through that I found a bunch of other stuff um, that I've listed here. Um, number The second one there is Teachers Pay Teachers. That's a website um, where people, teachers go on and they sell their materials that they feel they've created, um, you know, an activity or a worksheet or something that's really great. Um, so there are some things that are free. There's also things that are pretty inexpensive. So to me, if I have a topic that I just, you know, I just can't come up with something I feel is, you know, really good and I go on there and it's $2 to buy this activity, you know, once in a while that's worth it for me for a few things. So something to check out there. The uh, next one there, this word here, Dinah, is I think the lady's name. Um, she creates foldables, which I'm going to discuss in a minute. So if you want to write that down, that's just for the foldables that I'll discuss. And the last one is just blogs. I found a ton of different math blogs through Pinterest, and um, I stole my entire first unit of lessons from there for this year. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, and you know, if you feel like you're not creative, there's a lot of people out there way more creative than me, and they write amazing blogs and share pictures, um, and I'm going to keep stealing. So I want to encourage you to do the same thing. And I have a bunch of stuff that I stole in different subject areas to try to just, you know, kind of inspire you to get out there and look for some different things. The foldables that I was talking about, this is a foldable, I'll actually just show you here. Now, Dinah sells books on all these different foldables for different subjects. Um, however, you don't necessarily need to buy the book for the templates because this is just a sheet of paper. I folded it up, cut these strips. So the template is just like lines where to cut. You probably don't necessarily need that. So um, if you look out there um, on Pinterest, <coughs> blogs, people have lots of these foldables that you can do for free. You could even use binder paper if you don't want to waste the precious white printer paper, as I know it's in short supply. So I created this one, obviously, for math for me. It's got properties, and it's got all these different algebraic properties, and when you open it up, each flap, it has the definition and an example. Okay, now, if you think right now for your subject, I would think that you can think of some way to use this for your own subject. Dates, uh, people, vocabulary, there's got to be something. You know, and it's so simple, and yet, all of a sudden, they got to cut and paste, and they're so interested in writing down this information that you would have just had them copy down anyway. And then it's so much fun to go back and open flaps. You know, like, 
it's something so easy to do, and it makes it more interesting for them. And you know what? It makes it more interesting for me too. So, you know, use that kind of stuff. There's tons of different um, foldables. This is just one of them that I found. Um, and can I just ask, in terms of cat notes? So that one there, for me, I would probably put on the right side page in the notes section. Because mm -hmm. it is just what I would have had them um, write down. There's a couple other things and that I would do on the left. And you just have paste it into, like, for you guys, they have notebooks, right? Yes, so. I would just have them paste it in there. So here is um, a very similar um, foldable. It's only a picture, so I can't open the flaps. Darn. Um, but this is figurative language. It's got, you know, the simile and metaphor, so you could then open the flap and, you know, whatever notes you would want to do in there. So you can apply this type of thing to any subject. What did you, excuse me, what did you have on the right page of your foldable? On the left page, that's the, the page that falls. You have I mean, just had a title. This here, you mean? Or? Um, well, I have one around. I mean, she means when you open. Definition yeah. and example. Oh, example. Okay. Thank you. Here's another foldable. These ones fold up for um, Newton's laws. Example. Sorry, they're hard to see because the pictures are so dark, so I'm going to pass them around. Here's just a different style of foldable. Three flaps open. Picture, dictionary definition, their own definition, and the word is up there that you can't see. So there's a vocabulary one. Um, but again, I think you know, it doesn't have to be vocabulary. It can be used for a lot of different types of stuff. Um, so something interesting, I'm going to try to use some of them. Um, it does take up a little bit more time in your class, but um, if it gets them to write them down and be more interested and interactive in you know, writing down the notes, then I think that time is worth it. So that was um, probably, I would say, those would go on the right-hand side. Okay, these are some left-side things. Um, let's say you do some notes on a person. This is a Facebook page for that person. Um, and the reason I would say this is the left-hand side page is because they're going to come up with this stuff. They're going to process all the information you taught them about the person, um, maybe a video you watched on the person, and they're going to have to come up with, like, favorite music. And you really have to understand what you just learned about a person to try to come up with a song that they might like. Or if you can't think of a real song, they could come up with a weekend song. Um, and when I found this, it even came with the template. So again, get out there and search because people did the work for you. Um, you can download this. You don't have to make it yourself. So I can, you know, think art, history, English, um, math. Those all have different people for historical stuff. So this could work for a lot of different classes. This one is super simple and really hard to see. Um, this is right here. There's like a little thin strip of paper that the teacher wrote questions on that they wanted the student to answer. And then they pasted it in. So this would be like left side page, some questions to answer. And then the student just wrote them. That saves time with writing the question down. Also, it guarantees they have the question, because I don't know about you, but I can't stand when they don't write the question down, because how are you supposed to go back and read the notes and study from that? Um, but again, for some reason, when we paste in the question, it's a lot more fun to answer than suddenly. For some strange reason, we're more um, invested in our notes. And one last one I'll talk about. This is um, this person took the causes of the Civil War. They then had them draw a house. They created two stories in North and in South, and they you know, had to fill in the information. So it's taking maybe, again, you taught them a bunch of stuff about the Civil War. Now you're asking them to create this graphic. So they're having to take the information and master it and think about it, reorganize it in some way. Any questions on that stuff? Um, so Danielle was just talking about what you can put mainly on the left-hand side of your book. Uh, notebook, and then I'm going to talk more about what you can do as far as the columns questions, and then also as far as your summary. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you guys be students for a second. I'm going to have you start with your essential question, and for those of you who are 
new two cat notes, your central question is basically your objective or it's the question that you want them to be able to answer by the end of the day. So the essential question for you guys today is over here. It is, what are the key differences between a summary and reflection? So go ahead and write down that essential question first. And what you're gonna be using is in your folders, you should have this paper right here. It has a blank side right here, and it has the cat notes over here. So the very top, it says essential question, go ahead and fill that. Great, cool. Can you read it again so we can see it? Oh, yeah, and I can actually pull this up for it's second. It's okay. Just read it inside yeah. right okay. here? What are the key differences between a summary and a reflection? You're very welcome. <coughs> essential question when you start your notes, uh, then you're going to have your notes. There are a couple ways that you can use this question column. Either you can give them the questions yourself, which is sometimes nice if it's the beginning of them doing cat notes. Mm -hmm. It might be nice to give them the questions so that they can see what higher level questions look like and what kind of questions you're wanting on that left hand, the question mark over here. Uh, once you feel like they're more comfortable with what kind of questions you want, what you can start doing or do every once in a while, is have them just take the notes over here where it says teacher notes, and then we'll talk about how you can get them to come up with those questions. So what I'm gonna have you guys do right now is just take notes in just the teacher notes, ignore the question column for now, just taking notes right here on a uh, four to five minute video I'm gonna show you. So um, I'm gonna show you that and just take the best notes that you can. So that leads us to the question, why summarize for Cornell Notes? The first is that in Cornell Notes, you are recapping the most important information that occurred. You're noting the key ideas and main points from a lecture. The second is that it solidifies your own comprehension and understanding about what was important from a day's lecture. And finally, it provides you something that you can go back to and read very quickly to get a gist or a main idea about what was covered in a lecture, which will help you study right before a test. So then how should you summarize your Cornell notes? The best method is that if your teacher gives you an essential question, use that as a quick write prompt that will help you identify the main points from a lesson in order to generate three to four sentences. But even if a teacher doesn't give you an essential question, you want to try and think about your own overarching question, but ultimately drive back to that thought of what did the teacher want me to learn today? The next logical question is why reflect for tutorials and learning logs? The first is that it allows you to self-evaluate your own learning and understanding of material. It's also about self-improvement and the improvement of the process so that when you come across this information the next time, you'll have a better understanding. You also want to make sure that you're making connections with other learning and with real-life situations of when you might use this information. And finally, ultimately, it's about the growth of the learner to learn from past mistakes and to continue past successes. One of the ways to understand what a reflection is, is to understand what it is not. As an avid elective teacher, I used to get reflections like this all the time after tutorials. Today, during tutorial, I help John understand how to solve systems of linear equations. First, you need to convert the equation, blah, 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 blah. This is not a reflection. It is a summarization about key events that occurred. It's not about making connections to personal learning or growth. So then how do you reflect? The types of questions you want to ask yourselves are things like, 
Honestly, what is it that I understand now that I didn't understand before? Be realistic. Be truthful. How did you come to that understanding? Was it a question that was asked? Was it a source that you looked at that you hadn't seen before? And possibly, just as important as understanding what it is that you know, is an honest moment of what don't I understand? A lot of the times we think of tutorials as these magic bullets where we suddenly find out every question that we have. The reality is, is that a lot of the times there are still things that you don't understand walking out of that tutorial. You need to be honest with yourself about what it is that you don't know. And then how am I going to learn that information? Are you just going to passively wait on it till the next time it comes up? Or are you going to seek out a teacher or go to after school tutorials or set up a study group with your friends? And finally, you want to look at the connections that you can make between learning. How does the new information that you have relate to other information and other ideas that have occurred in the past? Together, these questions will help you grow as a learner and use your tutorial time more effectively to come to an honest understanding about what it is that you know and what it is that you still need to do. I encourage you to go back and revisit the essential question and summarize what were the key distinctions that characterize summary versus reflection. Okay, so you'll notice in that video they're saying Cornell notes, but really that's our CAD notes. And they're talking about tutorials and learning logs, and that's really our intervention worksheet. So they're kind of giving you an example of when to use a summary with CAD notes and when to use a reflection with the intervention worksheet that we use. Um, how many of you guys felt like that was really quick and it was hard for you to write down everything? Does anybody in here feel like it was pretty quick speed? I mean, your students are going to feel that way, especially if you're watching a video. Sometimes they'll feel that way even if you're writing every single thing down for them and you think that it's a good speed, for some students it's still going to be too fast. So a good activity to do with them after a video or a really important uh, day's lesson is to do a pair share. And I'm going to pass out a piece of paper that's going to you know, give you the minutes on this. But they say that for every 10 minutes of a lecture or video, you should give your students two minutes to pair share with their partner to see what notes they're missing. So what you're having them do is they're going to be sharing with their partner, looking at the notes that they didn't have and filling those in, and then vice versa. So what I'm going to do is, since that was a five minute video, I'm going to give you guys one minute with your elbow partner, go ahead and fill in any information that you didn't get and give them the information that they didn't get. Take one minute.
So for this last video we did, it was pretty short, so you could probably chunk it into two main sections. So I would tell you, okay, what I want you to do with your elbow partner is to chunk these notes that we just wrote into two sections. Once you have a sec those two sections, for each section, I want you to write a question over here in the question column that would help you understand this information over here. So instead of giving them the question that this information pertains to, they're coming up with a question themselves. So what I'm gonna have you guys do just to practice this because doing it ourselves help us, helps us to remember and it also lets us know what the students are gonna be going through and what questions they might have when we do this activity, is I'm gonna give you guys two minutes and I want you with your elbow partner to go ahead and chunk this and come up with a question for each chunk. So go ahead and chunk it into two sections. So go ahead and get started. Comprehend what you've already taught them, and the reflection is when you want them to be thinking about 
um, how, what, how the learning process went for them and what they need to be doing. So uh, that's the main differences. And then I'm going to hand it over to you now. Okay, so one of the things we're always worried about is whenever you have the time um, to do this. So I'm going to first talk about the questions column. Um, starting out, you can start by doing them for them so they can kind of see how that works with creating the questions. And hopefully as time moves on, you might move on to the pairing like we did today. Um, you know, that takes one to two minutes. That's not a ton of time in your class, but like, that can be fit into the day. And then, you know, hopefully eventually they'll move on to doing it on their own, one to two minutes. Um, you can also send it home as a homework assignment, depending on your level of classes and how you feel that will um, get accomplished. However, then when you come back to class, there needs to be some way for you to check and make sure that that was done. My recommendation would be using peers to do that. Um, obviously, we don't have the time to walk around and check all the notebooks every day to see if they did their questions at night. Um, so if you, you know, put them in groups, they can check and make sure that their partner did them. They can talk about the questions. And really, you're now having them review one more time because they're looking at their partner's material. Um, this can also work for the summary section. Um, if you have the time in class for them to write their summary, then I definitely recommend you use it then. That way they leave class, you know, kind of making sure that they understand everything. Um, but if not, then they could go home with that. And when their partner reads it the next day, again, that is going to review the previous day's lesson. Okay? But I just want to make sure to caution you that you want to move up to those steps. And it really needs to be done in class first. Because obviously, they don't quite know how to create the questions, and um, you know, they don't want to, quite honestly. So um, you definitely need to teach them that skill. Okay. 